Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if a game of chess is played perfectly, it's supposed to end in a draw. That's why if you put two computers to play against one another, more often than not, they're not going to beat each other. But we're humans. We are flawed creatures. And that is why we oftentimes win and lose games. There's a lot of things you could blunder in a game of chess. You could blunder a pawn. You could blunder a knight or a bishop, rook, queen, or a checkmate. You could make slightly more sophisticated mistakes like positional errors, creating backwards pawns, or isolating a piece somewhere on the edge of the board. But the worst mistake that you could make in chess, with the exception of getting addicted to it, is resigning a game in a game where you are not losing, in a position where you are not losing, and God forbid, in a position where you are winning. And that is the point of today's video. Five games that I have selected, shout out to Yosha Iglesias, uh, as well as Tim Crabb. Uh, they, uh, they had uh, two separate articles and a lot of really interesting examples that I compiled um, from them. Uh, Timestamps are on the video player. Uh, we are going to first start with the first documented example in 1902. And then at the end, there's going to be a game by Magnus Carlsen. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Uh, this was a game played in uh, some, some tournament. Uh, and it began with a Philidor defense. They used to play this all the time back in the early 20th century. Uh, regularly normal game, uh, black takes the center, sorry, white takes the center uh, with two pawns, and black attempts to defend it. A very, very locked and complicated game. Again, to the point of today's video uh, is not to analyze every single move uh, of every single game, but rather to give you an overview and then bring you to the critical moments uh, thereof. So, so black gets a nice little queenside expansion here going. This is all very standard for the Philidor, uh, and you'll notice that black is just already better. Uh, it looks like white has more space and could create some sort of an attack in the future. You can't go here right now with the queen. Uh, but the Philidor is actually well known for being a little bit like a porcupine. It's very spiky, and any way you approach it, uh, there's going to be problems. Like if black hadn't played the move knight g4, it was better for black to take in the middle here, uh, and then maybe try to expand with c5 and c4, trapping the bishop, for example, and getting a very nice position. But nobody really knew how to play chess in 1902. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, I'm not even joking, oftentimes if you look at games from like early 20th century, ninth, like 19th century, it's like in most sports. I mean, they just hadn't developed to the extent that it, they are now, right? Uh, and so... Uh, it's like how J.J. Reddick got into a little bit of a beef with Jerry West over, you know, Jerry West playing against plumbers is what he said. I mean, back in the day, literally, people in chess were not professional players. Uh, you know, Black uh, did typical Philidor things here, and it was a very complicated back-and-forth game. Uh, you'll notice that by move 22, um, White has a knight and a bishop, whereas Black has the bishop pair. Black has some pressure on the queen side, kind of a laser beam. Uh, down the C file, good pressure on the center, very imbalanced center, also E, D for black, F, E for white. Uh, white looking for some attack, but it, there's nothing really there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, Stockfish here thinks that white is a touch better because uh, black has certain weaknesses near the king. So for example, after a move like queen C4, white should back up. Uh, and even though black can take a free pawn, white can play a move like E5. And what this move does is that if this pawn were to get taken, queen h5 comes, and now we are, uh, we, we are in business. Queen g6, queen h7. King's just sort of been left abandoned with the window open, and uh, yeah, it's just somebody can get in through the window, and that's exactly what's about to happen. Uh, but instead of that, uh, Ignaz von Popiel uh, took the pawn on d6, moved the queen to b6, and black uh, really, I mean, still has visually a very, very nice position. The bishops are pressuring, the rookers are very solid. But this game ended very quickly. From this point forward, the game ended in five moves. Uh, I don't know if one of them had an appointment or, or what, but rook c1 attacked the queen, and then the, the queen pinned the bishop to the rook, so the bishop cannot move at all. And for that reason, black played the move e5, defending the bishop. Now, if you take this pawn, what black intended here was to trade rooks, uh, and I suppose go back and take this pawn right away. Now, that loses. Uh, it loses because you can move the pawn forward and it can't be taken. It can't be taken because after this, again, the absolute bulldozer battery of queen and bishop smashes the king. Uh, and g6, rook f6, and that's it. Uh, but in the game, knight f5 was chosen and white played, uh, black played queen e5, and white played rook to d1. And rook to d1, and black resigned. And that's why I added the eval bar for this video, because you're like, what do you, what do you mean black resigned? Yeah, black resigned. Well, well, look at the position. You're threatening knight takes bishop. 
the bishop can't move anywhere because then the queen will take the rook for free. And you can't take this because of this. So why is this position minus 3.7? If the position is minus 3.7, but no one's there to hear it, did it make a sound? I might have just uh, fused two sayings. Well, pause and try to find the move for black. Georg Marco could have won the game here with Bishop G1! Threatening mate, and the rook cannot be taken. So there is a threat on the queen and mate. Georg Marco resigned instead of playing bishop to g1. First of all, how quickly did this bozo resign? No disrespect whatsoever. Like, did he sit there for like two minutes? Did he just not see the move? That's crazy. That is crazy. Like, you could resign instantly. And actually, the next example I'm going to give you, uh, the person did resign instantly. That's the difference. When you resign instantly because you just assume you're losing, it's very different than sitting there for three minutes. So how much time did they have? I don't know. But this is the first documented example of such of a thing. And you know it's going to be a very fun video. Okay. Next game I have for you. This is a rapid game played between Francisco Vallejo Pons and Jaime Santos La Taza, who I believe now is a grandmaster, but back... This was a rapid game, so it was like a 30-minute game. It was an Imso Indian. We're not too interested in the opening. Black plays this exotic queen d5 move you can't take because of the pin. And Vallejo, you know, does 2,700 things in this game. He takes the bishop pair. He creates this blob of a pawn structure, develops his pieces in an obscure way, has this very strong central center. Central center. Thank God I'm a chess YouTuber and, you know, not a master of words or whatever that profession is. Uh, and in this game, Vallejo just has the two bishops and slowly but surely will probably expand forward like all 2700s do. He kicks around Black's pieces. He has, a, again, a nice, nice positional... And there we go. There it is. E4. Here comes H4. Here comes A3 preventing the queen's, uh, the queen side pawns from coming down for Black. And he's doing, you know, he's just, he's just slowly, slowly stewing the pot. Stewing the pot. He picks up a pawn. So now... When you look at endgames like this, you think of what's equal and what's not. Queens and rooks are equal, white has an extra pawn, but it's the bishops of opposite color that point to the fact that this will likely be a draw. Especially if all the pawns are on the same side. It doesn't matter that white is up a four on three, because black's going to try to trade all the pieces. White needs to avoid a bishop endgame. You could have rooks on, you can have queens on, but you need to avoid a full endgame. And that is why Vallejo happily goes here. Rook and bishop, rook and bishop. Four versus three. Now, if you just ask him for a split-second decision, he's going to tell you, of course, this is just a, a draw. I mean, White is going to try to press, right? So White does, in fact, try to press. Uh, he begins expansion. Uh, Jaime, uh, Jaime Santos fights back. Uh, Vallejo sacrifices his H-pawn to fully invest in the E-pawn. Full investment. That pawn's a square away from promotion. This, practically speaking, is probably White's best attempt at winning this game and making it into a YouTube video some years later. Um, rook e2. Here comes the king to try to boot out the uh, rook. Uh, but notice that the king is barricaded, right? The, the rook covers. Now, if the rooks are traded, it's just an immediate draw. This is not going to get through. So what on earth is going to happen here? How can Vallejo possibly win this game? Well, he's got to make a few trades, right? And by making a few trades, he gets a little bit closer. And time is ticking. It's a rapid game, so black is pretty low on time, right? All right, no progress is being made. He can't queen the pawn, so he trades another pawn. And now here comes white's king, all right? And now the winning chances start to grow because the king begins threatening the escape of the black king. And rook h8 is made. This is checkmate in one move, and black has to give some checks. If you give the wrong check, what happens is the king will run to d7. Maybe not to even to d7, maybe I'll just cover myself with my bishop. And that's it. I mean, I'm going to make a queen or you're going to get mated, right? It's got to be game over. Or I'll, yeah, some, somehow I'll go rook f5, try to get rid of your bishop, promote. So this is really a bad situation uh, for Santos Latasa, right? He plays rook to e1, bishop d4, mate is threatened, you give one check, king here. And I just told you, if rook f1, this is going to happen, right? You're going to block. Uh, and, well, what happens in the game is rook e4 is played, and sure enough... After sustained pressure, Vallejo has gotten to a winning position because when the rook moves away, trying to give a check, all white has to do is play king to e6, and the game is over. Rook h8 is mate. The only way to prevent mate is to sacrifice the rook, and that's it, okay? So, yeah, that, 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 he, he, he did it. It took him 67 moves, but he won the game. King to e6, and Francisco Vallejo Pons in this position played rook h8 check. And black resigned. Now, it's very easy to look at Stockfish and go, why did he resign? What? what? 
He resigned instantly because he probably had three seconds on the clock. Rook H8, cl clock pressed. I think what, the, what, what both players thought here was, this is check and this is mate. And they're not wrong. But they are wrong because you can take the bishop. And if king e6, there's no queen. That is why move order matters. You had to threaten this, but you didn't have to give the rook away for free. Both of them had an absolute brain fart. And white won the game in a position which is minus 42. It's not even minus 42. It's game over. Like, there is no minus or plus. The engine just isn't at a high enough depth. The game is over. That's a full rook loss. And he resigned. He resigned. Black resigned after rook h8. Oh my goodness. And I don't even think either player noticed. I think they just got up and were like, well, white won the game. Can you imagine the text messages that you would get after that? I mean, my God. Um, wow. What a game. Crazy. Uh, the next one that I have for you is a very famous one. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I like both of these guys. Uh, so it's, it's, it's tough for me to, to show this one. Um, this was actually played in the Olympiad. Because I think it was in the Olympiad. I you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look this up. I don't want to look dumb. Sometimes I make mistakes. Uh, no, no, no. I think it was in Tata Steel. I think it was in I think it was in Tata Steel. Could be mistaken though. Yes. Yes. This was a game played in Tata Steel. It was not at the Olympiad. They have played at the Olympiad, I think, but it is uh, this is Tata Steel. They might have never played at the Olympiad. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, an obscure opening by Anish Giri against Sam Shankland led to a very dynamic position uh, early on. Like White started this big queenside expansion uh, and looked to have a very pleasant position and the way shanklin fought back against this expansion was on the king side with f5 he was like all right you want to you want to go play in the sandbox over there all right I'm, I'm gonna go over here all right i'm gonna shoot some hoops i'm gonna do some big boy stuff f5 all right rook c1 uh c5 trying to prevent a niche from expanding and th this open file here is very nice for the for the black bear guy semi-open file but uh attacking possibilities are nice but for those attacking possibilities Black gives away one bishop. This bishop now could potentially could be strong and has some, you could argue, positional weaknesses like doubled B pawns, you know, some weaknesses here. Good control of the center by white. Potential maybe in the future to play the move F4, opening up this bishop. Dynamic position, but white is better. And so Anish uh, tried to neutralize some of Shanklin's initiative, right? He traded the rooks, okay? Uh, he traded the knights and uh, he started kind of chipping away at the structure. Now, you can't just rush in because the knight f3 check, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Black gets huge counterplay. So instead of that, Anish played check and f4. And this, now this is the best position that he probably had in the whole game because now his dark squared bishop in the corner is going to come alive. His rook is very powerful. His queen is just a shining star in the middle of the board. But Shanklin did not give up. And Shanklin fought and fought and got it to an endgame. And now e5 by Anish, and for a very brief moment, actually, Sam is up a pawn. Now, he will lose this pawn, or that one, and Anish probably was like, well, you know, we're going to get something like this, and this is winning for white. He probably thought, practically speaking, I'm going to get the two-on-one, and I just mentioned this in the Jaime Santos La Taza game, right? The pawns on the same side are a draw, but if two pawns against one on the opposite side of the board, that's brutal to defend, because you got to walk all your pieces over there, right? So... Gary probably thought he had some winning chances, but Sam, very clever, sacks the pawn, and now White has double pawns himself. And you, you know, be careful what you wish for, right? Because you got double pawns, and what are you going to do here, all right? So that... All right, but here comes Anish. King f2, king f7, king f3, knight h4, and uh, Shanklin fought back. I mean, right, it's 3-3, like, but White has the active king. White has the advanced pawns. The bishop is better than the knight because it's just faster. It's a faster piece, long range. Look at the white king just stuffing the black king on the back rank. And here comes the king. Like, you're going to the pawns, right? I mean, it's going to be a buzzer beater of a finish here as all the pawns fall off the board. It's a two-on-one. But Shanklin gets his knight trapped. This is the perfect example of why a bishop is better than a knight. It can lock it on the edge of the board. And king f5, king g4, and that's it. The game is just over. The game's just over. And, you know, what I imagine... Uh, Shanklin had calculated was I'm gonna get one of the pawns somehow by the time I can attack one of these pawns the bishop will have to guard it but he's a move too slow okay he's a move too slow and if king g4 were to be played here I think Sam wanted this you see and now the bishop cannot go and so easily defend 
because there is a, a potential sacrifice of some sort. Or maybe instead of going for the pawns, he thought he had king e4, for example. Uh, although admittedly then you're still, oh no, 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 you're not trapped, you're not trapped, because knight f4, yeah. Maybe Sam, Sam thought this, right? But b6 is a cold shower, and that's it. You don't, you don't have any more moves. You don't have any more moves. If you go to win this pawn, like, you would think this is just, this is winning for white, because you have a, but look at the eval. This is insane, right? Right? Just the total, but what, how? Well, here's why. And it's also a draw here. And that is why after b6, Sam resigned. He resigned in a position which is equal. What? This is why. Because black can lose the knight. It's a fortress. The king runs into the corner and cannot get to... It's like when your cat hides under your bed. This is what this king will do. And white can walk the king down. But it's a draw because there's no way to get the b-pawn without stalemating the king. Insane. It was a defensive fortress. It's a defensive fortress without, the, uh, without one of the pawns too, without this pawn. It's the same situation. Where it's not a defensive fortress is if this pawn were to be missing. Because then there is no stalemate, right? So if I edit this board, let me, before I edit the board just for instructional value, Sam Shanklin resigned in an equal endgame. He thought that he was going for this counterplay. And when he realized that didn't work, he was like, well, that's it. I just lose. But no, what I think maybe confused him in all of this, again, he probably gave an interview, probably already answered this, uh, that position where the king is in the corner, if I edit the board and I remove this pawn, this is a completely winning endgame. The point is that the B pawn has to have legal moves. Because in this case, when white gets close, this is stalemate if the pawn can't move, but it can. And by moving, you win the pawn and you win the game. Brutal! He resigned in an equal endgame. He thought it was over, but he just ran it. All he had to do, run his king to the corner. Crazy, right? Even at the highest level, these blunders happen. It's amazing. Uh, the next one that I have for you uh, is a game between Pia Kramling and Alexandra Kostinuk. You know both of these players. Uh, some, I mean, this might have been a Grand Prix event or something. It began with a Catalan. Uh, DC A6, a mainline Catalan with the system by Black of playing Knight C6. Pressuring the pawn on D4. And then Rook B8 and B5. So black trying to play a very quick rook b8 and b5. Very standard system, uh, played many, many times. White will now try to very slowly chip away at the queen side and, uh, well, try to live with the fact that you're down a pawn, but you have very, very good long-term pressure. And that is what Pia did. Now black is just up a pawn. So if black is able to successfully defend themselves, which is what... Kostinuk is trying to do here with rook b6, queen a8, and so on. Black is like, I'm up a pawn. I mean, like, good luck trying to win this pawn back. Right? That's kind of like the Catalan. So queen f1, uh, queen f knight e7, and here comes the trade of the light squared bishops, uh, and potentially the rooks. The rooks get traded. But white continues to pressure the position. Black continues to try to play uh, some degree of defense against the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the white pieces. I mean, white has a beautiful position. Everything is perfect. But white is a pawn down. And if white doesn't win that pawn back, white is just a pawn down. Like, white's got to win that pawn back and more. Otherwise, it's just going to be a draw. Okay. So, knight c5, right? And suddenly, the game opens up. The game opens up. White begins this kind of operation, this active operation forward. Mm, but here comes Kostinuk, and she sacrifices a pawn on a6 to attack the white king. f4 is a scary move because these pieces are drunk in the field, all right? They drank something, they passed out, they are not defending the king. No one's defending the king, actually, all right? The queen is, uh, queen is in the salon, the rook is just hanging out, you know, watching, making sure nobody gets to the queen. The king's just by himself, all right? So here comes EF4, and you can actually sack the knight. This is very scary, because if you take it, bishop F4 comes in, queen H4 is next, queen G5 is next, that's bad news. I mean, it's about to get real ugly. So bishop E1. Queen g5, here comes this, and check, and the king is being hunted. Now the pawn has to defend. Knight g5, threatening all sorts of stuff here. You see the evaluation. Uh, it's, it's in black's favor for sure. Here, Kostinuk has to play queen f5 with the idea of not just getting into h3, with another idea of potentially following up with h5, h4. All right, that looks really scary. 
And then the king is going to be wide open and the bishop gets a, a bird's eye view. So it's a very tough spot here, but Kostyuk makes a slight inaccuracy. All right, she makes an inaccuracy and Pia is able to begin some consolidation. She grabs the pawn. She fights fire with fire. But Kostyuk plays queen a1 and the knight is trapped. Nobody can guard the knight. You can't take the bishop either. And Pia Kramling resigned because what do you do? Can't move the knight. But for the fourth time in this video, Stockfish says it's zero. So what the heck? Who? What? Why would you resign here? If you see Stockfish, you don't see Stockfish. You and I see Stockfish. Why would White resign? It's zeros. But how? How is it zeros? Because of the incredible move B4. And if this gets taken, you pin the bishop to the queen. And if this, if this gets taken, you rescue the knight. B4. If C4, you rescue the knight all the same. Now, maybe Pia thought there was some c3 stuff, but the point is that after queen a1, the knight is trapped. But it's not. There's also another move, actually, which is bishop f4. And the point is you would defend yourself here, uh, and if this gets taken, there's rook d2. But black can actually... Uh, black can actually sack the queen for everything. <laughs> so this position does not look holdable for white. It looks like when, you, when a queen goes up against three pieces, it really looks like you're just going to lose, but... Stockfish is not so convinced. Stockfish would hold this with white. I doubt Stockfish would beat a human here with white. Just seems like impossible, but maybe. Um, but yeah, queen a1 and white resigned in a position where she didn't have to resign at all. It's craziness, right? Oh my goodness, b4. And the final example that I have for you, this video, oh sorry, this video would not be complete without a game by Magnus Carlsen. Uh, Magnus Carlsen, uh, former world champion, ever since he said he wouldn't defend. I guess he still is until someone wins it. Uh, number one player, and this was a game that he played uh, in, a, in a tournament in, I believe, like, it wasn't Linares, or it might have been, but it was the first time he played Topalov, and Topalov in 2007 was world number one. Carlsen was 2690. Uh, this, was a, this was a semi Slav, and again, we're not going to focus on the theory too much. It was a very quiet game. Uh, it took until move 13 for Carlsen to attack in the center. Uh, they traded pieces, and then Topalov tried to trade bishops with him. And uh, Carlsen got a very, very, very just like tame, slightly better middle game where he was just trying to suffocate and squeeze and uh, use the d6 square to his advantage, right? Look at this. He builds up a3 before knight d6. Remember, he's playing the world number one, so he's got to do something with his good position uh, as the evaluation hovers around zero as it does in top level chess. Black is using this very nice light square blockade to fight back against the d4 pawn. Unfor unbreakable, uh, unstoppable force meets an immovable object, tells you that either this game will simply end, end in a draw very soon, or one side will take a calculated risk and do something. The players are sort of shuffling their pieces, nobody can really decide what to do here, and Topalov blunders on the 40th move and allows Magnus to play this incredible move d5, uh, which would have permitted him to get the c-pawn rolling and get this beautiful square for his knight. Carlsen doesn't actually find d5 straight away uh, and instead opts to just pressure the e6 pawn. But notice that I'm, I swear we've had this position before. Here comes g4. Now, g4 is a calculated risk because you see the engine hates it. The engine does not believe in this at all. It thinks that actually the h file is the battleground for uh, black. It doesn't think that white is doing anything substantial. But Magnus made it work, okay? He played queen g6. He played even h6. Look at this position. Black has to get this uh, minus one by just grabbing a pawn over here. Carlsen left it to die. His idea was, I'm sure, to play rook f4. And uh, suddenly you see the engine actually has changed its mind on a higher depth. That the pressure here is unsustainable for black. And probably white has some good attacking ideas. Which is why Carlsen did all of this, right? Remember a long time ago I told you about the move d5? Move that looks impossible? Yeah, well, uh, hello. And Carlsen has seemingly put everything together. Okay. Queen d5. Black is temporarily up one pawn, but after rook g4, rook h1, I mean, really? Look at this. This looks very scary for black. And the computer agrees, finally. It thinks that actually uh, Carlsen is a genius. Yeah, we've known, computer, we've known. Uh, after queen e8, hg, uh, white is completely winning. Rook takes g7, check, the king has to run. And now after takes takes, uh, there is a winning move here by white, which is incredibly difficult to see. Carlsen plays the far more human move and loses his advantage. Uh, but knight d2 wins for white. A backwards knight move trying to get that d6 square. I told you about that d6 square 
30 moves ago. But you have enough time in this position to go 94, 96. And the game's just over. Like, let's say black tries to fight back, 94. King e7, black tries to, you know, run with it, 96. And then you just relax. And you can actually have enough time here to just slowly improve your position. Rook g1, black just runs out of moves. Black legitimately can't move anything. Knight d2 is not very human. It's much more human to play the move rook h6, but now black can play queen d7 and begin somehow fighting back, right? He plays queen d8. Here, we repeat once. Uh, but now, where's the mate? Right, where's the mate? Well, now Magnus goes for the knight d2 idea. But you'll notice it's a draw. Right? It's a draw, apparently. Queen d5. You can't take because it's mate, but black can play rook f7, for example. Uh, he plays f5. f5 prevents knight e4 but allows the knight to go back there. Pawns don't go backwards, right? So Magnus baited f5, and now he's going to go back here. But here Tsipalov sacks the rook and wins, it, wins the rook back. And now it's going to be a little bit tough. But Tsipalov resigned in this position. What? But it says point two, Levy. What are you talking about? I know. But look at the board. How do you stop check? For example, how do you stop check here, check and here. And just lose the game, right? How do you stop that? After queen h7, and so on. But how do you stop that? You can't. You can. In this position, and this is why you never resign if there's a check on the board, okay? You have to at least give one check. Because after white covers up the check, you don't give another check, but you play the move e5, which covers f7, and it covers g8 and there's no way to get the king away from the queen it's like romeo and juliet they die together except in this case they live together spoilers by the way romeo and juliet <laughs> spoilers um topalov resigned in a position against magnus that was completely equal queen d5 and moving up the pawn to cover queen g8 he just thought he was lost for a while i guess and called it a day right here. Insane. Folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. There's many more examples like this. You could find these examples, you know, uh, look up resignation in equal position, resignation in winning position. But I wanted to show some names that you would recognize. I wanted to show the first example of this. Folks, don't resign. All right? It's good practice to know how to checkmate your opponent. It's good practice for them. It's good practice for you. What are y'all doing? Don't resign. You guys crazy? Look at this. You never know. You truly never know. All right? Don't be one of these people. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.